I want to thank you for joining me today for Biblical Criticism 101. It doesn't sound very exciting, but let me tell you where I got this idea because I was concerned that lay people often have the wrong impression about the Bible and how we got the Bible, how it got to us in the form that it's in. And whenever there's a vacuum of information, we start making up all types of conspiracy theories and crazy things because of our ignorance about this. And so, I, you know, a couple of years ago, I, there was actually a woman, a uh, friend of ours, and she had posted something on her Facebook page about all those evil, satanic translations other than the authorized version, the 1611 King James Version. Those are the really hardcore people, by the way. There are some people who are okay with all of the different King James Versions, but there are some who are so hardcore, it's only the 1611 version of the King James Version of the Bible that you must read or else you're going to hell, basically. And so she posted all these evil satanic things that these new translations of the Bible uh, left out of the Bible because obviously they were editing the Bible. And so it was a whole list of things. And this is why you must read the King James Version of the Bible, the authorized version. So this was the story, and I kind of interacted with her a little bit, and I said, well, you know, it's not exactly that way. There's a reason why, because, again, the copies of the Greek text that they were using, blah, 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 and she just lambasted me. Well, you really are in error, Pastor, and you need to repent because you're leading your people astray. <laughs> Maybe you've run into a friend who's told you that if you don't read the authorized version, the King James Version, you're going to be in deep, deep trouble. Well, what version of the Bible should we read? What translation? There are some significant differences between the translations of the Bible. Is it the King James? Is that the right one? Is it another English translation, the New, Inter New International, the RSV? We have all of these translations. I was talking just a month or two ago with, with a very brilliant man, actually, and, and we were discussing this, and I said, you know, I do, I don't have any problems with the King James Version of the Bible, by the way. I do get concerned about people who are adamant about only the King James Version of the Bible. And we're going to get into that in a minute. And he said, well, you know, I don't have a problem with other translations, but I don't like this idea of them trying to compile a Greek text together out of more ancient documents. We should read the Greek text that the church fathers read. And I said, oh, my goodness. There again is another piece of ignorance. Now, he's not a bad man. He just doesn't understand that there is not exactly available to us the copy of the Bible that the early Christians used to read. That is part of the problem. Both of these ideas express a bit of ignorance about how the Bible was composed, how it came to us, and how it was ultimately translated. So we are going to look at, at that. And today it's going to be about creation, the transmission, the translation of the Bible over these next three sessions. So. I know, I was asked a question again, and you probably want me to answer right now. Which version of the Bible do you prefer? What do you think is the best, Pastor? I'm not going to answer that. Not yet. Okay? My answer would be simply this. None of the English translations are perfect translations. In fact, if you're not reading the Bible in the original Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, because there actually are Aramaic verses in the Old Testament, you are getting somebody's interpretation of a text. However, there's another challenge, because that actually expresses an arrogant, ignorant attitude as well. We don't have the original Greek texts that the authors wrote. We don't have the original Hebrew texts. In fact, we're well over a thousand, probably 1,500 years away from the original Hebrew texts. Those are the earliest texts we have. They date over 1,500 years from the early authors of the Bible. The closest book that we actually have is what we call the Greek translation, the Septuagint. That is closer to the original Hebrew text than any of the Hebrew texts we actually have. And you're like, wow, this hopefully is blowing your mind. It's kind of crazy. 
We have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies, and that is as close as we can get to the original autographs of the Bible. So here's what my purpose is today. Because again, I want you to not be ignorant. I'm a pastor that doesn't cram something down people's heads and say and throats and say, you got to believe this. I'm going to give you information. And at the end, I will tell you my opinion. And then I encourage you to make up your mind. I would also tell you, if you have a pastor who's cramming something down your head and saying, you don't believe this, you're going to hell, you need to find another church. Okay? We don't do that here at our congregation. That's not the way I believe the pastors ought to lead their parish. We are here to give information and allow the Holy Spirit to guide and direct people. So let's go on. So I'm going to start with my opening bias. As I just indicated just a few minutes ago, I am not anti-King James Version. There are a lot of pastors who are. I happen to have a great deal of respect for the King James Version of the Bible. The thing is, I think we can do a lot better than the King James Version of the Bible. We have. However, there's a caveat to that. Just the opposite. We have also done much worse than the King James Version of the Bible. That's the corollary is also true. So I want to be very clear, I'm not anti-King James. I have such respect for what the King James Translating Committee did back in the 1600s. So we're talking over 400 years ago. It's amazing what they were able to do. What I am against and what I don't have a lot of respect for are those who are adamantly the King James only version people, King James only ism as though there are no other translations of the Bible that you can possibly read, because we have a finalized English translation that will be good for one and for all, for all time. That just isn't true. You know, it reminds me, uh, it reminds me of the uh, movie Elf. You remember watching the movie Elf, and of course Elf, uh, played by Will Ferrell, uh, takes his girlfriend, uh, Zoe, Dax Null, uh, into a coffee shop, you know, he blindfolds her, he's on a date, and he says, here, sit down and try this. He says, it's a crappy cup of coffee. No, it's not a crappy cup of coffee. It's the greatest cup of coffee in the world. <laughs> she said, where do you get that? He took off her blindfold and says, it says so on the sign. Well, that's kind of like the King James Version of the Bible. It's called the authorized version. You do realize that's a marketing gimmick. People are trying to sell you something. This is the only authorized version, as though it's authorized by God. Well, where that title authorized came from, it was authorized by the publisher of the book so that people wouldn't go and buy another English translation. It's a marketing gimmick. That's all it is. I know that ticks off some of the King James only people. But we're going to tell you why. We're going to prove that to you. It just a bit. But here's what we're going to do over the course of these next three sessions. This three-part presentation, today we are going to look at the Hebrew Testament, uh, the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament, its creation and its transmission. We're not going to get to translation today. Creation and transmission of the Old Testament. Then we will, in our next session, a week from today, look at the Greek Testament, the New Testament, its creation and transmission. And finally, in our third session together, we will look at the translation of the Greek and the Hebrew Bibles and how we get the translations and which translation I prefer and why. And then I'm going to let you make your own decision. Now, between now and then, I know you may end up having some questions because we are in a time and a season of, uh, of life where we are not able to get together. I was hoping to have the people of our church and other folks who are interested in filling the space and being able to interact with me today. We can't do that right now. But that's okay. I will ask you, if you have any questions, to please post them on our Facebook page underneath one of the advertisements for this class. I will be happy to try to include those questions every single time. In fact, if we have enough questions, we might end up doing a fourth session just on questions and answers. Maybe we might even be able to work with a call-in or uh, back and forth type of thing with you if we're able to do that by that time in life. So there you go. That's what we're going to do. I'm going to start today with the Hebrew Testament. Yes, that's the Hebrew Bible. 
However, this, this actually doesn't look anything like the Hebrew Bible as it was originally written. But we're going to talk about the Hebrew Bible. As I said, we're going to start with the Bible's creation and its transmission. How did we get the Hebrew Bible in the form that it's in today? Well, we're going to start by telling you that a lot of Christians get this idea that the Bible was just dropped from heaven. Ta-da! There it is. Into our laps, dropped from heaven, and we just kind of were mimicking or reflecting whatever God whispered in the ears of the authors, and they just pass it on to us, and here it is today. From God's ears to our eyes in the Bible. I guarantee you that's how a lot of Christians think if they actually think about it. But that's actually this guy's idea of what the Bible is. You may not know this guy. His name is Joseph Smith. But you have heard of the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Joseph Smith believes that the Bible, his Bible, the Book of Mormon, dropped from heaven into his lap. He was the only person to see it. It was written in a foreign language, some type of Native Indian American, Native American language that nobody else knew or nobody else could read. And so guess what? God also gave him some spectacles called the Urim, Urim and Thummim. So he was able to translate the Bible. And once he translated it into English, that uh, ancient Bible was taken back up into heaven. And so, therefore, he has the only authoritative translation of this book. Therefore, this is what all, by the way, authoritarians do, don't they? They want to make sure that you know that they have the only Bible, and you must come to them if you're going to get the truth. It's not, again, how I operate. I don't believe that's how God operates. The Bible just wasn't dropped on a golden platter so that we could, therefore, consume it today. It was a lengthy process that took over a millennium. So, here's what we have. We know that the Bible developed over a millennia. It didn't come to us in some finished final form. We know this, even the Bible itself kind of gives us a hint of this development process. If you look at the book of 1 Kings 22, I encourage you at some point to take a look at these verses. We won't be able to take the opportunity to read that today. But in 1 Kings 22, um, uh, this is, by the time we get to this passage, as it's being written, it's evident that whoever is writing the book of 1 Kings 22, when they thought of the Bible, the only books from their perspective that were in the Bible were the books of Moses what we might call the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. They were considered to be the canonical books of the Bible by the time of King Josiah. Now, we are told in the passage of 1 Kings 22 that these five books of the Bible have been neglected for 300 years. Almost the entire history of the nation of Israel. Is what we, uh, and so... Um, these books were sitting there, they were dusted off, they were finally brought to King Josiah, and King Josiah said, oh, we need to start reading these again, and highlight how important these are. But again, the Bible was five books. That's it. The Tanakh, the TNK, we'll get to what Tanakh means in a bit. The Hebrew canon that is celebrated today was not formally established, oh, did you see that date? 140 A.D., after the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, it was probably pretty much in the form that we celebrate and read today, but it wasn't formally canonized until that time, after the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That I find absolutely stunning and amazing. So let's go on. So how did the Bible come to us? Creation of a canon. Now, we'll get into canon in just a minute. Um, the collecting of the stories. I know, you, did, did you see that canon that went by? I hope you could see it, this is my cute little thing. Uh, when I say canon, it's canon with one N, not with two, okay? It's canon, not the weapon, but the word canon means the authoritative uh, standard uh, the, the, that we value and esteem, okay? So how did this canon of the Bible get collected? Well, the first thing that happens is the collecting of the stories. And so what happens is there were pre-existing stories that were passed on verbally for maybe hundreds and hundreds of years. If you take a look at the prehistory of the Bible, Abraham and Isaac and all those stories, 
Where did they get those stories? It's not like Abraham and Isaac were writing these things down and passing them on. These things were told generation after generation after generation. Sometimes we end up getting conflicting stories because one family tells it one way, another family tells it another way. That's kind of what often happens in the Bible. You don't have to look very far, Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Two, two conflicting, not necessarily conflicting, they were actually written together, or written separately but brought together to create a cohesive unit. But there are two perspectives, two stories on the same event. And so this is what happened. Somebody passed on these stories, some rabbi, some pastor, some village storyteller. At some point, somebody said, hey, this would be great. Let's write these things down. So the stories were then written down in some type of text. Now, it was quite a while before Hebrew was invented. We're going to get to that in a minute. But here, right here, this is what we call the Ketef Hinnon amulets uh, from 600 B.C., Okay, now just to put this in perspective, the nation of Israel came into being about 960, 980 B.C. So this is 300 some years after that. This is actually the priestly benediction found in Numbers chapter 6. It is something that existed separately from the Bible. So probably what happened is a lot of the things that are in our Bible started getting written down separately from the book that we now call the Bible. Well, at some point then, somebody said, hey, let's collect these stories. Let's collect these bits of wisdom and put them into a larger collection. And now we start getting the books, more of the form that we have in the Bible. And so what happens, we have these collections. We might have multiple collections. A collection of these books, a collection of these things, a collection of this. Somebody gets a brilliant idea, let's pull this all together into what we call the canon. Again, those books that we esteem and claim to be authoritative for our faith. This is a pretty cool book. Let's pull it together. Let's pass it around. Because these books are now authoritative as far as our Christian faith is concerned. Decisions were made which books to keep. I'm sure also there were some what we call redactions in these books. Now, you're, what in the world is a redaction? Okay. A redaction is where somebody has a pre-existing story or a pre-existing book, but it doesn't quite fit my context. And so I bring it in my context by maybe adding something or a bridge that connects it to my context. Well, you know, Jesus often did that. He would tell a story. Well, you heard the story told this way. But I tell you, this is what it means for us today. That would be what we call a redaction. Jesus was very good about doing redactions, about taking an old story that people had heard a different way and updating it for the context of his, the people to whom he was preaching. So this is obviously what uh, the early Christians did. They redacted certain things. We actually have an example of that in uh, Jeremiah 36. I apologize I don't have that up there. But Jerry, Jeremiah 36, let me tell you a little bit about that story. Um, Jeremiah had presented uh, um, something that God had told him to write to the king. And, um, and of course the king just ripped it up. <laughs> Didn't accept it. And so God said, go and write it again. Basically word for word. He did, but then it says, very interestingly, he added some things to it to connect it to what the king had done, the ripping it up of the text. He redacted the text. He added something to it that included what the king had done to the text. That's a redaction, okay? So we have examples in the Bible itself, evidence that redactions took place. Now the Jewish canon ultimately is what we call the Tanakh. Tanakh, okay, T-N-K. The Torah, the prophets, the writings. And yes, these are the Hebrew words for that. So when all of these books finally come together, we now have what we call as Christians the Old Testament canon. Now, please be aware that's somewhat offensive to our Jewish cousins in faith. Because they're saying the Old Testament... I kind of like the idea of calling it the Hebrew Testament, although that's maybe not an apt or accurate description of it. 
there are many biblical scholars and many of my pastor friends that say, well, you know, there's problems with calling it the Hebrew Testament, and I get that. First of all, it's not all written in Hebrew. Secondly, there's more to it than that, but we're not going to necessarily go into that. But the Tanakh, the Hebrew Testament, the Torah, the Prophets, the Writings. Let's go on to the next one. Oh, which books were redacted? We already talked about that. Let's go on. So when did this take place? Now, I already told you it's about 140 A.D. when the books were formally canonized. However, they likely existed long before this in the form that we have them today. I believe that probably evidence seems to indicate, seems, did you notice what I'm saying? I'm not saying that it does indicate, I'm not saying that what I'm telling you is 100% truth. We don't know all of this. This is the best speculation based on the research that we have today and on the evidence that we have internally in the Bible and the evidence outside of the Bible. It was probably at the time of the Babylonian captivity that the Bible really started taking the form and shape of the Bible that we enjoy today. The shape of the Old Testament canon, the Jewish faith. And that was truly a transformational event in the life and the history of the, of the Hebrew people. See, what happened is that you might, might remember there were one nation, Israel, was divided into two, the northern tribes and the southern tribes. And the southern tribes we call Judah. Those are the tribes that for the most part the Old Testament deals with. Not entirely. There are some passages about the New Testament in the book of, uh, in the book of First and Second Kings and so forth. And, um, so here's the deal. So these two countries separated. The northern tribes were destroyed. The southern tribes existed for quite a while longer. But then they were ultimately taken into captivity. The country was destroyed by a nation called Babylon in what used to be Mesopotamia, Iraq, Iran. It was smaller, not quite as impressive a country as Mesopotamia, but it were, they were the people, the, the, they were the descendants, at least in terms of the people who lived there. So these folks took the Jewish people into captivity. And it was there that the Jews kind of made a decision. We can continue to believe that we're supposed to be people of the land, or a thought process can change. We are no longer people of the land. We are people of the book. And so this book, this canon, became very important to them. And I have a great deal of confidence that it was at this time that a great portion of the canon of the scripture was either written or finally pulled together in the form that we have it today. Again, the people went from the people of the promised land to the people of the book. This is a major transformation of their thought process. Because before, we were always associated with the land that God had given them. That land is now gone. They don't know that they're ever going to be back. Normally what happens with most people of faith, when you lose your land and you associate your land with your relationship with God, your faith ceases to exist because another God bigger and better than yours has come and destroyed you. But that's not how the Jews responded. They said, well, if the land was taken, it's probably because we deserved it. We need to come to some repentance. We need to redefine ourselves in our relationship with God. And so now they are the people of the book as opposed to the people of the land. I want to just, just an aside, just as an aside. There are some evangelical Christians, Zionists, who are so fixated on the Jews occupying the promised land. Whether you're aware of this or not, this was not a Jewish sentiment. The Jews of the 1700s, 1800s were vehemently opposed, the religious Jews, vehemently opposed to reoccupy Canaan, Israel. The people who wanted to put them there were evangelical Christians to fulfill the prophecies of the Bible. But the Jews were very happy being people of the book and not people of the land. They understood that the promises of God were not tied to that land, that they were fulfilled through the promises that God made to them in that book. And so I, I want to be careful. I mean, obviously we do have a nation that's called Israel today, and they're a great ally of our country in the United States, and that's fantastic. 
But like all countries, like our country, they're not perfect. They make a lot of mistakes, and we should not mistake them as the spiritual ancestors of the people of the Old Testament. They may be Israelites, or Israelis, but they're not Israelites. So let's go on. A transmission. So, again, that was a general idea of how we got the Bible in the form that it was in, but now it has to be passed on to us. So now we have this Hebrew Bible of 30, uh, 39 books, right? How did it come up to us? How did it get passed on to us? And so to do that, we need a little bit of an English or a Hebrew grammar or Hebrew uh, language primer. You're going to be really educated after this about language. Language is such a fascinating thing. But you have to understand this because as I told you earlier in our lesson today, we do not have the original copies of the Hebrew Bible. We're not even close to it. The chances of anything like that being found are almost zero. We are over 1,500 years and copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies from the original texts. That's how far away we are and how many copies are between the copy of the Hebrew text that we have now and the copy of the text that was written by the original authors. So how did we get there? It went through a lot of transformations. As I told you, some profound transmission, trans, transmissions took place. So we're going to start with Egypt. Remember the Jews had some connection with Egypt. You might remember the story about Moses and the people of Israel in Egypt and so forth. Um, the Egyptians spoke what was called the, an Afro-Asiatic language, and they wrote in a form called hieroglyphics. This language, this Afro-Asiatic language, it was not called Egyptian, by the way, but we call it today an Afro-Asiatic language. Um, this was a language that was spoken all the way up until they were conquered by Rome. At the time of Rome, Latin started getting interfused with this Afro-Asiatic language, and now we get this language called Coptic, which, by the way, is a very ancient language. Nobody speaks Coptic anymore. It's only used in liturgy and worship in Coptic Egyptian churches. But that's kind of the bridge between modern day and the ancient language that was spoken by the ancient, ancient, ancient Egyptians. So that was one of the ancient languages that was spoken. It's very likely that the Jews had, uh, prior to their existence as Israel, had some interaction with the Egyptians, and some of them spoke this language. Don't know. But again, Abraham, of course, came from Mesopotamia. That's a different language. So let's go on. So the Mesopotamians were another people that they interacted with. As I mentioned to you, Abraham, we are told, came from ancient Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq and Iran. They spoke and wrote a language called Sumerian. Those words were written in cune cuneiform. Yes, if you look at all of these images that we're posting up here, they do go with, they're not just pictures I picked off the internet somewhere. These pictures actually go with what I'm talking about. This actually is a cuneiform form of Sumerian. There are symbols and strokes that represent words or concepts. It is a very difficult language to learn because every concept, every word has a different stroke pattern. So you literally have thousands, tens of thousands of different figures. And so the only people who could actually read Sumerian were people who were educated and spent their entire life learning Sumerian. It was not a very democratic form of language. This became a dead language around 2000 BC. But if we accept the Bible, what the Bible says about Abraham and Isaac and these folks, they likely read, or not read, but at least spoke Sumerian. Certainly not Hebrew. We're not even close to Hebrew yet. So let's go on. After the Mesopotamian language, Sumerian, the Akkadians defeated the Mesopotamians. The Sumerians, they replaced their language with the Akkadian. The Akkadian language is the very first Semitic, Semitic language that was created around 2500 BC. That is really significant. Hebrew is also a Semitic language. It's a much later Semitic language. 
It is one of the Semitic languages, but it used, what it does is Semitic languages were profound. They truly democratized language. They used letters to create words. Think about that. That's what we do in English. So they, that's the combination of letters of our alphabet that creates a word. We can make as many words as we want to out of the letters of our alphabet. It is amazing. This is a democratization of language because now, not only is it the wealthiest of people who can only learn how to read and write, common people can learn how to read and write. So this Akkadian language, as I mentioned to you, was the very first Semitic language. It's not spoken anymore. It still had some bumps and bruises in it. They had a long ways to go. But it was replaced ultimately uh, by Aramaic. The language that was spoken by King Darius of Persia and ultimately the Jews. But we're going to come back to that in a minute because we now have the development of the Jewish, the Hebrew language, classical Hebrew. The Jews, who again were very likely at this point speaking Akkadian, Sumerian to Akkadian, they developed their own Semitic language called Hebrew. Classical Hebrew, as I said, was a Semitic language developed around, look at the date, this is very important, 950 BC. This, by the way, is a very ancient shard from a pot with the Hebrew language on it. One of the things you may or may not notice if you know anything about Hebrew, and I'm going to be frank with you, I can read Hebrew, I, can't, I could not tell you what that says. I couldn't. This is classical Hebrew. This is prior to my understanding of Hebrew. I don't understand classical Hebrew. And I'm going to tell you why in a few minutes, because there's another few developments before we get to the Hebrew that we're reading in the Bible. One of the things that you will notice about Hebrew, if you know anything about Hebrew, there are no vowels in Hebrew, only consonants. So the consonants were implied by, these, by the vowels, how they were structured together. And so people would understand that these two vowels together would imply such and such, or these two consonants together would imply such and such a vowel. But again, I want you to notice the date. As I said to you, that is really, really important. Because that, 950 B.C., represents, well, before we go on to hear Biblical Aramaic, I apologize for pushing that ahead, because I want this, this is kind of really geeky, this is important. 950 B.C. coincides with what? The, found, the founding of the nation of Israel. It is very likely that King David himself, we don't know this, but we do know that this is as far back as we can trace classical Hebrew. Okay? It is, if it goes back to 950 BC, it was likely David or Solomon who created, or were the, I should say, the... Uh, the people who encouraged the creation of the Hebrew language. It didn't exist prior to David or King Solomon. That's really profound. So, little aside here, you notice 950 BC. Hmm. Everybody talks about the books of Moses being written by Moses. Hmm. Well, if Moses did write the book, uh, the five books, the Pentateuch, what we call, he certainly did not write it in Hebrew. Now, I personally don't believe that he wrote the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I think it's a misunderstanding of the Hebrew language. There's a word that we often translate the books of Moses. It could be the books about Moses. It could be the books written by Moses. It could be understood as the books written for Moses. It could be the books written uh, inspired by the work of Moses does and focuses on the work of Moses because that's what it ends with. Because everything in that is redacted to point to Moses and the covenant that God created Moses. There's nothing in the Bible that indicates that we must understood it, stand it as books written by the hand of Moses. It just, so I'm inclined, there's no evidence one way or the other, but I'm inclined that the evidence just seems to indicate that Moses did not write these, that these were written much later. And when we call them the book of Moses, it's because Moses is the focal point of these books. Even when we look at Abraham and Isaac, all of them are ultimately pointing to the work of what Moses did. And so that's kind of the backdrop of it, the foundation 
leading to Moses. So that's why I believe that we call the books of Moses, not because they're written by Moses. So there's no reason to accept that the authorship of the Pentateuch was done by Moses. Now, let's go on. So we have classical Hebrew. Classical Hebrew is a language existed for, well, you know, 400 years. 300 to 400 years. Because now we have what we call Biblical Aramaic. The use of Aramaic happened when? Oh, let me think. Important date and time in the Hebrew history. The Babylonian captivity. The Babylonians were not Sumerians. They were not Akkadians. They were invaders to ancient Mesopotamia. They were Semitic peoples who brought with them their language, Aramaic. Again, a Semitic peoples, their Semitic language of Aramaic. Aramaic likely developed about the exact same time as Hebrew, about the 10th century BC. But now here are the Jews, remember how we already said how they were defeated, they're now in Babylon, what language are you going to start to use? <laughs> they were permitted to keep their Hebrew language. I mean, after all, it was a Semitic language. It shares an awful lot in common with Aramaic. However, Aramaic became, in the end, the primary language of the Jews around this time. Because Aramaic ultimately was the language also of King Darius. Do you remember who King Darius is? He's the guy from Persia. And he's the guy who released the Jews from captivity in Babylon. And so I'm sure that they were quite inspired by this, and they started using Aramaic as opposed to Hebrew. And so Hebrew kind of became like Latin, I guess you could say. You know, in the Roman Catholic Church for many, many years, Latin, I mean, Latin just fell out of disuse, and it was only used in the Roman Catholic Church for liturgy. And most people go to church on Sunday and just... Because they didn't understand Latin. They kind of got the gist of it, but they really had no clue what the priest was saying because they can not understand Latin. That was, that was up until Vatican II in the 1960s when now all of a sudden the Catholics were permitted to, to say the liturgy in their own native language, in English and so forth. But prior to that, the Mass was always spoken in Latin. Nobody knew what the heck was going on unless you'd taken some Latin. And I think that was kind of true with classical Hebrew. At this time, around 550 B.C. and later, the only language that was spoken by most households was Aramaic. And the only time they heard Hebrew was when that priest would get up in, in the synagogue or at the temple and start reading in, in Hebrew. And they all, here goes that priest droning again in that Hebrew. Nobody understood Hebrew, okay? Or very few people did. So again, after King Darius... As I said, classical Hebrew was only used in, uh, in, in, in liturgy. Eric, as I said, Aramaic became the primary language of the Jews until the 3rd century B.C. There was something that happened in the 3rd century B.C. Another cool story, because now we're going to have a transformation of the language again. By the way, I know we're talking about the Bible. Everything that I'm saying impacts how we read the Bible and the Bible that we have today. So hang on to these thoughts. It's really important. In fact, so important was Aramaic that about 250 verses in the Bible are written in, the, in Aramaic, not in Hebrew. So that's why we can't just call the Old Testament the Hebrew Bible. There's a significant sections of it that are written in Aramaic. And if you were to put the Aramaic in front of me and say, hey, Pastor Dave, why don't you go ahead and read this? I'd say, I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't read it. If my life depended on it, because I don't understand I don't understand Hebrew. I'd have to have a dictionary there and have to open it up and keep going back and forth. I, I don't know what that word is. Oh, it's an ancient Aramaic word. No wonder I don't get it. There are some of the structures that are very similar, but I don't get it. Because it's a different language. They're related, but different. So again... By 300 B.C., and so again, by, certainly by 300 B.C., the form of the Bible is finally in the shape that it is, uh, that it is today, even though it wasn't canonized at that point in its entirety. So the Hebrew, the Aramaic, all of this soup that it was growing up in had an impact on how the Bible was formed. But I told you they spoke Aramaic up until 300 
what happened in 300 BC? Oh, the Hellenization of the Jews. And you're saying, what, what? What is the Hellenization of the Jews? I don't get it. Um, Helena is the name that the Greeks use for themselves. The Hellenization of the Jews. So as I mentioned to you, the Persians, King Darius, freed the Jews from Babylon. So now you have this big upstart nation of people, these Greeks, and of course they're a warring nation, nation states. They're warring with each other, but these Greeks were powerful nation states. And I'm going to tell you, they were the bad guys. If you were to ask a Jew of 308 BC whether they were rooting for the Persians or they were rooting for the Greeks, oh, those Greeks are awful. We're rooting, for the, we're rooting for the Persians. They're the good guys. They're the ones that delivered us. So we get this idea when you reach, watch the movie 300. You know, Mr. Butler there with his, with his pecs and shirt off and showing you how beefy he is as a Spartan coming up against those, those 300 men against those evil Persians. I guarantee you the Jews were rooting for those evil Persians. And oh, by the way, that's probably, <laughs> that, that is not the way um, that is not the way Xerxes looked. This is probably a little bit closer to the way Xerxes looked. That's just from an ancient imprint and so forth that we have. So he was not some wild, crazy guy. He was actually very conservative and a great king. So like I said, Jews, bad Greeks. Yes, Persians, go. They were good to us. They delivered us. Well, that's not the way it happened. The Greeks ended up winning. The Greeks defeated the Persians. That also has an impact on their understanding of the Bible. Ooh, let's go on. As I said, the Greeks eventually defeated the Persians. The Jews became a vassal state of the Greeks, and they didn't like it very much. They had a lot more freedom under the Persians. Persians didn't care. As long as they paid them a little bit of tribute, hey, we're all good. You want to keep your faith? Keep your faith. We don't care. The Greeks imposed their authority upon the Jews, and the Jews did not care for that. At the same time, the Jews now became multilingual. They spoke Hebrew in their liturgy. They spoke Aramaic in their homes, but now because they're under the Greeks, they have to start learning Greek. This has a massive impact on the Bible. We're going to see why in just a moment. The Bible at this time is translated now into Greek. It's what we call the Septuagint. That is the word for 70. The tradition says that there were 70 scholars who took the Hebrew Bible and translated it into Septuagint. You might see this abbreviation, the LXX. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the number 70, okay? So that's what the Jewish says. Um, I am outright telling you today, we would not understand the Hebrew Bible were it not for the Septuagint. We wouldn't understand it. We wouldn't be able to translate it. So even though it was a bad thing for the Jews to be defeated by the Greeks, in the end it was a good thing for us and at least our understanding of the Bible. Here's the thing, we have more ancient copies of the Greek Septuagint than of the Hebrew Bible. We have the Greek Septuagint dating all the way back to the things we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. Scrolls. This is a fragment of the Septuagint. Look at the date, 50 BC! We don't have a Hebrew Bible a copy of the Hebrew Bible that's older than 1000 AD. So this is more ancient than any Hebrew fragment of the Bible that we have. The Greek Septuagint. That's profound. It's kind of amazing. So we, are, we owe a tremendous amount of gratitude to these 72 Jewish scholars who translated the Bible into, from Hebrew to Greek because we would not be able to understand it Today, there's so many words that we don't get, but because we do understand Greek, we know what they mean. Isn't that amazing? And we get it from an authority, Jewish scholars, who knew the Hebrew, translated into Greek, 
We get the Greek, so therefore we know what some of these Hebrew concepts mean and what those words are. Kind of an amazing thing. Oh, we're not done with the language development of the Old Testament. <sighs> Greeks didn't last very long. <laughs> you know, they, uh, um, they got defeated by the Romans. Okay, Alexander the Great, he came along and made this great empire, and after Alexander the Great, everything was downhill after that. The Romans finally conquered the Greek peninsula around 146 BC and the Battle of Corinth, and that is kind of the end of the Greek era. And now we have the beginning of the Roman era in the world. And um, the Romans, the Romans um, again, they took over Israel from the land of Canaan, from, from the Greeks, but they started really getting frustrated with these Jews. These Jews were really troublesome people at that time. We see that some of the Bible, you've got the zealots and the people rebelling against uh, Rome, and they constantly had to fight off uh, these Jews. And so uh, one of the things that happened, uh, they finally got fed up. Uh, some of the Jews kicked out the Romans for several years. The Romans came back and just obliterated the city of Jerusalem around 70 AD. And that, when the Jews were expelled from Canaan, that became what we call the Great Diaspora. It wasn't the only diaspora of the Jews, but now the Jews were absent once again from the nation of the land of Canaan from the nation of Israel for almost 2,000 years, 1,900 years, right? The Hebrew language basically became extinct. The Jews started speaking the language wherever they were. The Septuagint, as I mentioned to you, became critical to understanding the Hebrew language. The Jews almost forgot their own language. That's how profound this is. Let's go on. So what happens? For hundreds of years, the Jews have lost touch with their own language. We have this Hebrew Bible. It's in disrepair. Nobody's ever read it. But along comes these Jewish scholars, the Masoretes, who decided, hey, we need to resurrect the Hebrew Bible. We need to bring it back into a shape that we can read it again. We've heard it read in worship and in liturgy, so they wanted to recreate as best they could the Hebrew text so it could be passed on for generations, so it could be used in worship, so no matter where the Jews went, they had a witness of God's love for them, for the Jewish people. So thank God for the Masoretes. Here's what they did. They were the, they were the scholars from about the 6th century to the 10th century A.D. So for 600 years, the Hebrew Bible was basically in great disrepair. But what they did is they decided to create a system of vowel points that therefore stabilized the Hebrew language. Remember I told you earlier, and you might forget because I'm passing so much information to you right now, but I told you ancient Hebrew only had vowels, no con or con consonants, I'm sorry, no vowels. And uh, people were forgetting how to pronounce it. So the scholar said, Let, we, we know how it sounds. So let's create a vowel pointing system of dots and dashes and this and that that indicate how this language is supposed to be spoken so we don't lose the ability to read and understand Hebrew. So they preserved it for future generations. We owe so much a debt of gratitude to these Masoretes. This is an example of a of a copy 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 of Masoretic text. Um, I can't remember which one this is. This is, oh, um, it's from the book of Amos. I'm not sure which Masoretic text it is. I probably have it in my notes. But it is one of the, um, it is one of the texts, a copy of the copy from about uh, 1600. So this itself is probably 600 to 1,000 years after the Masoretes did it. We don't... We only have fragments of the work that these Masoretes, Masoretic, uh, of, the, of the original Masoretic texts, but the text itself became pretty much standardized and stabilized at this point. And we have all sorts of different copies of them, and that's not going to come up. That's okay. Multiple what we call codexes. Let me go back and see if I can get that. 18. There we go. I think it was the last one. So we have multiple what we call codexes. 
uh, that still exists. They are complete copies of copies of copies of the Masoretic text. So the one thing, as I indicated to you, it shows how brilliant these Masoretes were, how stable the text was. I lost it again. I'm just going to leave it off. But there was called the Aleppo. Uh, uh, there was the, the, the text from Aleppo. We had, uh, um, um, oh my, the uh, Aleppo Codex, which was found in Syria around 930 AD. Um, that was one of the more famous ones. The Leningrad Codex, which, not surprisingly, was found in Russia around, uh, it, it dates all the way back to about 1000 AD. It's one of the most ancient ones. But we also have the Ashgar Gilson text, which dates back to the 7th century. Again, they're usually named after the places in which they were found. And the one thing that we find between all of these different codexes is there's such a high agreement between the codexes. There's an occasional mistake or differences between them, but it demonstrates the rigid scholarship uh, and the, and the, uh, of the Masoretes and how they stabilize the Hebrew text so that we could have it today. Now, I just want to, one last thing before we go on, I'm going to summarize it today and we're going to be done for today's session. But we have one last development in Hebrew, and that's modern Hebrew, and it has nothing to do with the Bible. You might be surprised about that. If you know contemporary modern Hebrew, you couldn't read the Bible at all. If you know Biblical Hebrew, which again is Biblical Hebrew is established by the Masoretes. That's when we talk about Biblical Hebrew. It's not the ancient Hebrew of the early Hebrews. It's not what they wrote in the ancient texts. It's what the Masoretic priests wrote and how they stabilized the text with a vowel point. That's what we read today, what we call Biblical Hebrew. Okay, It's different than ancient Hebrew, as I said. But modern-day Hebrew has absolutely very little outside of many of, uh, many of the uh, consonants looking exactly like the consonants back in the day, and they're probably pronounced similarly, but it's a different language. They took contemporary language structures, and now it's structured like a contemporary language. And so, like I said, a, per a Jew today who lives in Israel and speaks contemporary Hebrew would not be able to read the Bible because it's just totally different language. So... I don't know contemporary Hebrew. You could put something contemporary Hebrew or a newspaper in front of me. Don't ask it. Don't put it in front of me. I couldn't read it. I wouldn't understand it. Okay? So let me summarize here. It is a windy path by which the Bible was created and transmitted. It is over now a 3,000 year history to get to us in the condition that it's in today. It was certainly not dropped on a platter as the Book of Mormon was for Joseph Smith, from the mouth of God to our ears. It was a very eventful transmission, but not as eventful as we're going to find in our next class about the Greek trans transmission and translation of the Greek text. But that's likely because, this is my theory, likely because we have been participants in the creation, Western culture has been the participant in the creation and transmission of the Greek text. And so we've seen that, and we know the history of that a little bit better than we do that of the Old Testament. But it is likely the Old Testament's transmission was filled with just as much turmoil and conflict until it got into the form that it, uh, we enjoy and appreciate today. I am looking forward to our coming classes. I hope this was helpful to you. I hope you heard some interesting stories about how we got the Hebrew text in the form that it is in today that we enjoy. We're going to get to some translation of that in two weeks' time. But next week we're going to talk about the Greek text, how it was created and how it was transmitted and came to us today. If you have any questions, you are welcome to place those on the advertisement for the Facebook page, on our Facebook pages about this class, and I will try to answer those questions as we go, maybe at the beginning of the next class, or maybe again we'll save those questions, put them in reserve, and do a fourth session where we just answer your questions. We might even be able to have people live and here in the audience at that point. So again, let's just close with prayer and give thanks. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful thing that we call uh, our, the Hebrew Bible, the, our, what we call the Old Testament, of course, is the book of faith for our Jews, Jewish cousins in faith. And we just are so thankful 
and so grateful for the faithfulness for all those rabbis and all those authors who were so stringent in making sure that it was passed on in good condition to us so that we could benefit from it and our lives touched and transformed by your word. It would sure be nice if we were just dropped down on our laps for, in a golden platter. It's not how it happened. But to me, that just makes it even more spectacular. That despite the twists and turns of history, despite the defeats uh, at the hands of the Persians and the Greeks and the, the Romans and all of these things that took place, the Bible still came to us. Your word still was presented to us. And we can still be touched and transformed by your love. We are so grateful. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, have a blessed week.